The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the another episode of Thought Leadership Monthly Meet by the LHRD Bangalore chapter uh, uh, for the month of um, July. Here, uh, we're really excited because we have an international speaker with us, uh, Jeff McDonald. Uh, but before we start the evening, uh, you know, introducing the speaker and the moderator, I would like to uh, you know, take you through the details about Bangalore chapter and the different programs that we do. Uh, just a throwback uh, in terms of the programs or the certification programs that we have done, um, you know, in the last months or what is it in coming months. Uh, we have a lot of different initiatives that we do as a as the Bangalore chapter. Uh, monthly meets uh, is probably one of them that we've been doing it, you know, on a Thursday evening of the month that we do this. When it was regular face-to-face -face events, we used to do it at Chancery. And now, since the month of March, we've been doing it on the online platform, uh, go to webinar. And then we have a lot of learnings, HR showcase, uh, you know, confluence, which is completely for students and academia that we do, uh, different programs that we do it. How one can become a member, you know, of NHRD Bangalore chapter. Uh, if you're not, please log on to nhrdbangalore.com and uh, look for membership options. Uh, we have individual as well as institutional memberships available. Uh, if you currently are uh, already a member, which is annual silver or gold, and if you would like to you know, extend it to a life, you could do it before it expires. There's an option. Just write a mail to us and we will definitely help you out on that. So in July, uh, we had two certification program that we did, uh, workplace analytics uh, and design thinking. Uh, we had about close to 70 participants, you know, being a part of this. Um, we may have the second version of this program coming up soon. So watch the space, keep us, uh, you know, uh, look at us on social media as well as on website. You will hear from us uh, on the upcoming programs. Uh, we also had a very interesting program that we did. We have done this earlier, and this is the virtual speed mentoring that we had. Uh, this was exclusively for NHRD members, uh, young HR professionals. We had about close to 15 of them taking up this uh, just about a week back uh, that we had. Uh, so what's in store? Uh, this month, um, or say probably August month, we have something very interesting coming up, two live sessions. Uh, which would be broadcasted on our, on, you know, social media channels, largely YouTube and Facebook. Uh, on 1st August and 10th of August, we have one which we are doing roundtable with young HR leaders. Plus, we have a fireside chat or with Nagat Siddharth on his book, How Many on Your Human Number. We also have uh, two certification programs that are upcoming um, in the month of uh, September. Art of Business Storytelling. Uh, the registrations for this program is already up and live on our website. Uh, special pricing of 5,000 plus GST for members, which I think it's a steal. So log on to nhrdbangalore.com and look for this particular course. Uh, the other one in association with vSchool, Industrial and Employee Relations, should be um, you know, up for registration soon. What else? We also have an interesting initiative that uh, NHRD has started, uh, you know, in association with, uh, which is the NHRD Inclusion Lab. Uh, this is basically a pilot program that we're doing it for about 10 organizations, mentoring them to, uh, you know, become uh, stronger enough in the, in the and make a difference in the area of DNI. Uh, it's completely free. Uh, for the organizations. We are looking to do this for about 10 organizations now. Uh, log on to our website. More details are available on that. Otherwise, you can reach us you know, at the email IDs mentioned here. Uh, happy to assist you uh, with, with any information that you would need for this particular uh, inclusion lab program that you would need. Since the time that we've gone online, uh, uh, we've had about over 3,000 participants uh, since the month of March. Uh, specific format that we do on a monthly meet, about 1,200, over 1,200 people have attended it. Uh, we've done a couple of episodes, uh, sessions like this for students as well. And I just talked about, you know, certification program. 
so this is this is a little bit of of what we have done in the last four or five months. Uh, you know, keeping in mind our virtual events, and there are many more which are coming in. So do keep us, you know, stay connected with us. And uh, before we sign off today, and I hand over the mic to Pallavi, um, you would definitely would like to hear the feedback from you on this particular session. Uh, the feedback slides will open up towards the end of the session, but you just need to log on to menti.com and use the code uh, 372518. I will share this later again uh, once we open up this, but do share your feedback, which helps us, uh, you know, presenting more and more programs like this for you in future. Um, on this note, not taking too much of time, um, I would request Pallavi, uh, who's the uh, Joint Secretary for the NHRD Bangalore chapter with me in the EC, and also a consultant by herself to you know, invite the speaker and take on the evening from her. Pallavi, over to you. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Um, and I'm sorry, there seems to be uh, something wrong with my webcam, and so I'm not able to come uh, on video. But um, uh, welcome all of you to this uh, session. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we were thinking of what we really wanted to do in this session uh, this month. And uh, we thought that uh, um, really looking at employee well-being and how do we as HR look at creating awareness and implementing processes um, of mental health at the well uh, at the workplace was an important topic uh, that was getting discussed and that would be something that we would uh, want to uh, listen to someone on and uh, we are very glad to have Jeff McDonald with us um, Jeff, uh, for, since 2014, has been a consultant uh, and a global advocate and campaigner. He works uh, in the area of mental health, especially um, in how do workplaces and um, organizations work towards removing the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces. And he works with uh, leadership teams uh, to figure out how purpose can become a key driver in the workplace. Uh, prior to um, uh, 2014, uh, Jeff was the global VP of HR at Unilever. Um, welcome, Jeff, uh, to our talk today. We are really looking forward to you, listening to you. And uh, before I hand over to Jeff, I would like to thank uh, Chris Shankar, um, the president of uh, our national, NHRD National Board, for introducing us to Jeff uh, and uh, for... Um, speaking with him on our behalf so that he could be with us uh, this evening. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Pallavi. Can you hear me okay, Pallavi? Yes, I can, we can. Okay, so I'm assuming uh, everybody can hear. Yes. Um, yes. So thank, thank you so much for that very uh, kind introduction. And you know, I'd also like to just extend my thank yous to, I know, I know Krish as Shanks, because we worked together for many, many years in Unilever. Um, so I will refer to him as Shanks, and I would like to extend my thanks for him reaching out to give me this wonderful platform this evening to uh, engage with you on a subject that I'm very, very passionate about, which is around uh, addressing the whole stigma of mental ill health in workplaces. Uh, Mitch, thank you too for, uh, for you. For, I mean, it's amazing uh, what your organization is doing. I was just having a look at it. Uh, on the website before the session uh, and to see you know what you are trying to do in the whole area of people development across India and creating a very a very professional HR function and just listening to all those wonderful activities that you've got for your members it seems like a, a very worthwhile and fruitful organization so thank you all for having me today and um, you know I, I just think it's wonderful that uh, that that Shanks in many ways might have catalyzed this event around just being able to have this conversation about mental health and mental ill health. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of campaigning and advocacy work around the world. And, and I am very, very mindful of the the different stages that different cultures and different nations are at in addressing the whole stigma around mental ill health. 
you know, here in the UK, I've been very involved over the last eight years in trying to create a far more open environment where people feel comfortable to be able to, to have conversations around their mental ill health. But I've also done some work in Dubai, um, in uh, the Middle East, uh, in Africa. And, and clearly, you know, like in India, you are not the same as the UK. Um, you are not at the same level of being able to have these conversations. And I, I just think it's, I just think it's, and I just want to recognize that. I want to recognize the cultural differences that exist around the world with respect to this particular issue. Uh, but I want to congratulate you for, for engaging in the conversation, at least getting this conversation going in your country. And the reason I think that that is so important is, you know, if we can just have a conversation, and hopefully that's a little bit of what uh, this evening is about, is me catalyzing a conversation. If we can have a conversation, then irrespective of where you are in the journey around addressing the stigma of mental ill health, anything becomes possible if you can just have the conversation. And I often think about John F. Kennedy when he one day he started a conversation which was about putting a man on the moon and bringing that man back safely. Guess what? It happened. It happened because they were able to have the conversation. And I think it's the same with mental health. If we can just start having these conversations, then anything, anything becomes possible for you in India, for you in your organizations to create workplaces where people feel that they are able to talk about their mental ill health. I have very fond memories of your country. I mean, I, uh, I did a global job in Unilever. Hindustan Lever, as it used to be called, was a, is, is and continues to be a major player for Unilever in terms of its performance. And, um, and I'm just so privileged today to be able to bring my message to a country that I love. I spent many, many uh, days, many weeks in different parts of India during my career with Unilever. And uh, it's just wonderful that in some ways, COVID-19 has democratized the conversation around mental health and mental ill health and has allowed me to engage in countries, organizations, where in the past they might not wanted to have this conversation. But I think COVID-19, COVID-19, has democratized the conversation around mental health. You know, I don't think there's anybody out there or any nation state which is kind of or organization where individuals are not feeling a little bit more anxious, a bit more stressed, where CEOs, chief financial officers, CHROs are feeling that way and, and almost getting a sense of the whole mental health subject. So in many ways, COVID-19 has done a lot to help me to get the message into, into organizations where I might not have been able to do so uh, in the past. Finally, I should just recognize where you are as a country in terms of COVID-19. I want to just recognize the impact that it is having on your country. I was just looking at your cases, over 1.5 million in the excess of 30,000 deaths. And that's real bereavement, that's real tragedy for individuals, for families, and for communities. And I would just like to recognize uh, uh, the, the challenges that you are all going through uh, with, respect to, with respect to COVID. Now, you give me a platform today um, to actually just live out my own sense of purpose. And I think it was Mark Twain who once said, he, he said, what are the two most important days in your life? And you know, when I, when I ask audiences, when I talk in different parts of the world, and, I, and I'm on a stage and I throw that question out to the audience and I say, Mark Twain, what did he say are the two most important days in your life? Most people answer by saying, the two most important days is the day I was born and the day I die. And then I think to myself and I make a comment back to the audience to say, what is it about the human species that we are so pessimistic? We can't wait for the second most important day in our life, which is the day that we die. 
So let me be born, day two, put me in an incubator, and maybe I'll die. And that is an important day. And of course, Mark Twain didn't say that the two most important days in your life is the day you were born and the day you die. He said it's the day you were born and the day you find out why you were born. Why you were born. And you know, I honestly believe that every single person on this webinar today, everybody who is born, we are all born with a unique gift, a unique gift that when we uncover that gift, when we uncover it, we can bring it to the world to make it a better place. And getting in touch with that why, with that unique gift that you bring to the world to make it a better place, helps to answer the why. And I'm very, very clear on that why. It's a very, very simple why. And let me just share with you what my why is. It is to try and create workplaces. And you know, a fire brigade is a workplace. A school is a workplace. A university is a workplace. Yes, Infosys is a workplace. Yes, Tata is a workplace. Yes, Unilever is a workplace. But I want us to try and create workplaces all over the world, all over the world, where people in those workplaces feel that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and to ask for some help if they are suffering from a common form of mental ill health. That could be depression, it could be anxiety, and it could be bipolar. I think we should have workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces, in families, in communities, where people feel that they genuinely have the choice to just ask for some help if they are struggling with a common form of mental ill health. And I don't think that's a very noble purpose. And let me tell you why I don't think it's very noble. Because in every workplace, in most families, in most communities all around the world, People feel they genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and ask for help if they are suffering from a common physical illness. There's not a family, a community, a workplace around the world where if you have a common physical illness, you feel completely comfortable to put your hand up and ask for some help. Yet in the 21st century, 21st century, when we talk about driverless motor cars, artificial intelligence, we put men and women into space. We brought them back safely. In the 21st century, we still have workplaces all over the world where as we talk this evening, billions, not millions, but billions of people are suffering in silence. We have families, we have communities where people are suffering in silence and they don't think that they can just put their hand up and ask for some help. And how can that be right in the 21st century? How can it be right that I can't talk about my mental ill health, but I can talk about my physical ill health? And you know, everybody on this call tonight, including me, we are all mental. There's not one of us who is not mental. That means we have cognitive abilities. There's not one of us that's not emotional, where we have feelings. There's not one of us who is not physical and there's not one of us who has a spiritual entity to ourselves. Yet we find it so difficult to talk about the emotional and mental part of who we are. And in the 21st century where most workplaces are driven by what I would call a knowledge economy, where our cognitive ability, our mental health is so, so important to be able to analyze data and make a good decision, to be able to concentrate, to be able to focus, to be able to read a document and remember what you've had, read. That cognitive ability is so, so important. And you might say, well, Jeff, why are you so passionate about trying to create those sort of workplaces around the world? What is it that's, what is, what is, what lit your fire to want to go and do this? leave Unilever at the end of 2014 to go out into the world and do this work. And what lit my fire, and I'm going to share with you my story today, 
is back in 2008, I'll never ever forget the date. It was the 25th of January, 2008. And you know, the reason I don't forget that date is because on the 26th of January, 2008, my eldest daughter was gonna turn 13. So you can imagine how much excitement there was in our household on the evening of the 25th of January, 2008. Because here's this young girl who at midnight on the 25th of Jan was going to go through a rite of passage. She was going to become a teenager. And there's probably nobody on the call tonight who can't resonate. Do you remember that day? The day just before you were about to be a teenager, how excited you were? You were going to wake up the next day and you were no longer going to be a little girl or a little boy. You could now call yourself a teenager. And I remember Jennifer that afternoon saying to me, you know, Dad, tomorrow you talk to me differently. I said to her, what do you mean I talk to you differently tomorrow? She said, no, I want you to talk to me differently. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, tomorrow I'm not your little girl anymore. I am a teenager. <coughs> and you know, at midnight on the 25th of Jan, I got woken up. And I got woken up with the most massive, massive panic attack. Now, I had never experienced a panic attack in all my life. I had no understanding of what a panic attack was. I don't think I'd ever, ever had a conversation with anybody in my family, at work, with friends about a panic attack. It wasn't, the words were not part of my vocabulary. And my fingers are tingling. The ends of my toes are tingling. My heart is beating profusely. I'm struggling to breathe and regulate my breathing. I'm sweating profusely. My, the bed sheets are wet with sweat. And because I'm so naive about this, I think I'm about to have a heart attack. And I bumped my wife, Debbie, that evening, midnight, and I said, Deb, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and I remember Debbie rolled over and she said, why? And I tried to explain what was going on. And she said, well, and you know, every time I tell the story, I can feel the anxiety. Every time I tell it, I still feel that anxiety. And so at this moment, I usually take a deep breath. And she says to me, why don't you get up and walk around the room and take some deep breaths, which I do. I get up, I walk around the room, I take these deep breaths, and slowly, slowly, the levels of anxiety begin to subside. I get back into bed, but I can't go back to sleep. And I can't go back to sleep for three reasons. The first is the adrenaline is pumping through my body, which keeps me awake. The second is I'm petrified that if I fall back to sleep, it'll happen again. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, having a panic attack. And the third reason I can't fall back to sleep is because I develop a capability of being able to catastrophize over the most insignificant issues in my life. I'll never forget it. I got up at about three in the morning and I had a sore on the inside of my mouth and I went into the bathroom, I looked in the mirror and I interrogated the sore, got back into bed and I convinced myself that I had the beginnings of throat and mouth cancer. And so here I created a mountain out of this molehill. I had this capability of just catastrophizing over the most insignificant issues in my life. Molehills became mountains. And so a combination of adrenaline, fear of falling back to sleep and it happening again, and catastrophizing thoughts, I just lie there and lie there. And seven o'clock the next morning, who comes running into our bedroom? Jennifer. Why? Because in our family, we have a bit of a tradition on birthdays. We all have presents at the end of the bed and we open the presents together. And her younger sister, Anna, comes running in with her. She's so excited. Her 13th birthday. And all I can say to her mum and to the two girls is, please, please leave me alone. Please go away. Please, I, I can't engage in anything that is celebratory, that is fun, that is happy, where there's enthusiasm, where there's laughter, where there's excitement. I can't engage. I can't engage. And I just ask them to please leave the bedroom. And all I want to do is take the duvet, pull it over my head, and I just can't get myself out of bed. I'm riddled with anxiety. I feel paralyzed by the levels of anxiety that I'm feeling. 
The girls go downstairs, they open their pre Jen opens her presents, she gets ready for school, Debbie takes her off to school, gets back home at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Where am I? Still in bed. And I'm not the person who lies in bed until 10 o'clock every morning. You know, I'm the sort of guy who loves his sport and the outdoors. I'm a typical South African. And um, I'm usually up early going for a run or a bike ride or a bit of a swim. And here am I at 10 o'clock on my daughter's 13th birthday, still in bed. And Debbie gets home and says, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know. And she said, Jeff, this is not like you. Please, please, will you go and see a doctor? And I thought, no, why must I go to a doctor? I've got no aches. I've got no pains. I'm not feeling nauseous. I haven't got a temperature. There's no reason for me to go and see a doctor. She said, no, please, I want you to just go and see somebody. It's not like you. Lunchtime, I'm in the doctor's rooms. The doctor begins to ask me a whole bunch of very strange questions, which I think, why is this doctor asking me these questions? And by the way, when you're suffering like I was back then, one of the early symptoms and signs is the le your levels of irritability, they go through the roof. You get irritated over the smallest little thing, irritates you, that what no what would normally not irritate you. And he starts to ask me questions around my diet and have I lost weight? And yes, I had lost quite a lot of weight because I struggled to eat breakfast and lunch, but could eat dinner. He asked me without, you know, did I, had I stopped doing the things I loved doing, like riding my bike or going for a swim? And I said, yes. Over the last couple of weeks, I just had no, no joy in doing those sort of things. What can you read and can't you read? I said, I can't read a newspaper. Why not? Because every time I read a newspaper, and there's something very negative, or you read a story of a, of a parent losing a child, it just triggers me and I just feel so sad. So I've stopped reading newspapers because I can't take on the bad news. Have you stopped socializing with friends? Yes, I've become a bit of a, you know, I just want to be on my own. I don't really want to socialize and do things that I used to find was fun. And then he asked me a very difficult question. He said, have you had any suicidal thoughts? And I thought, oof, that's a hard question to answer. I knew the answer because I had had those thoughts. And I thought, look, I'm going to be honest. And I said to him, yes, I have. And he said, he said, Jeff, so you have had suicidal thoughts? I said, yes, I have. He said, have you planned anything? And I said, no, I haven't planned anything, but I do know the method. And he looked at me and he said, you're ill. And I looked at the doctor and I said, what do you mean I'm ill, doctor? I said, you know, you haven't, you haven't put your stethoscope onto my chest. You haven't listened to my heart or my lungs. You haven't taken my blood pressure. You haven't looked into my eyes. You haven't looked into my ears. You haven't looked down my throat. What do you mean I'm ill? You've done no diagnosis of me. I said, Jeff, you're ill. I said, I'm ill with what? He said, you're suffering from anxiety-fueled depression. Anxiety-fueled depression. Me? Depression? No. And let me tell you what my understanding of the word depression was up until that day. My understanding of the word depression, I'll give you maybe three examples. When I, when I first was moved from Unilever South Africa to the UK, and I was looking after HR in Africa, Middle East, and Turkey for a while, um, I'd been here for about two years in the UK, and around January time, people used to talk to me about a condition called SAD, Seasonal Effects Disorder. And I used to say to them, what's that? And they'd say, no, it's the weather. It influences your mood. And I remember I used to think to myself, what a load of rubbish. The weather? The weather influence your mood? Come on, why don't you just man up, you snowflake? That's what I used to think. I know that India is a cricket-loving nation. Well, try and be a South African cricket supporter, particularly when it comes to one day internationals when it comes to world cups we are known as the chokers and i remember i would say to my wife 
when we got into a final and we lose a final, I would say to Debbie, I am so depressed about this South African cricket team. Or I'd wake up of a morning here in the UK and I'd want to go for a swim or I'd go for a run and it's pouring with rain. And I would turn to Debbie and say, you know what, I'm depressed. And she'd say, why? I'd say, because it's raining outside. I mean, this was my understanding of the term depression. And here I am on the 26th of Jan, 2008, my daughter's 13th birthday, I'm diagnosed with anxiety fueled depression. When I leave the doctor's rooms that day, I make a decision that saves my life, literally saves my life. I don't think I'd be engaging with you today had it not been for this decision that I made. And the decision I made was that I refused to be burdened by the stigma that is associated with mental ill health. I refused to be burdened by the stigma. I refused. And I'm the sort of person who wears my heart on my sleeve. You can see my feelings in my eyes. I find it very difficult to mask it. And so I thought, I'm just going to tell. I will tell my daughters, my wife, my close friends, and some of my colleagues at work that I'm struggling with anxiety fueled depression. I had to take three months off work. Now you might say, Jeff, why did that save your life? And the reason it saved my life is that every single person that I engaged with, bar a couple, you know that I got back from them the most powerful emotion that kept me alive during my darkest, darkest moments. I was very naive about this illness. I thought that, you know, when the doctor said, do you want medication? I'm saying, yes, why? Because I thought it was like an antibiotic. You'd give me some medication, three days later, I'd start feeling better. Well, guess what? Six weeks, seven weeks, I'm still not feeling better. We have to change the medication. And during that time, I'm going through dark moments. I go through moments where I don't think life is worth living. I don't think, I think I'm a burden to everybody around me. But the only thing that kept me alive, and it was because I was able to talk, because I was able to have those conversations with family, close friends, and I was so lucky. I had an employer, I had a boss at the time who had a compassionate, he had an understanding relationship to mental ill health. And what I got back from all of those people was the most powerful emotion in the world, and it is called love. Love. Do you know in my darkest moments, knowing how much I was loved, by my daughters, by my wife, by my friends, by some of my colleagues. Just feeling that love in my darkest moments, it's the only thing that kept me going, to know that I was loved. How often do you talk about love in your workplaces? How many songs have been written about the power of love? Amidst fear and hate, what that could look like. And yes, through a combination of feeling loved, medication, cognitive behavioral therapy, slowly getting back onto my bicycle, meeting with a friend every two weeks who a couple of years prior to my illness had been so sick with depression that he'd been hospitalized. And I used to meet with him and I saw he was better, he gave me hope. And so a combination of hope, knowing that I could get better, feeling loved, love, medication, CBT, et cetera, et cetera, I get myself better. I had to take three months off work back in 2008. I reintegrate myself back into Unilever, slowly, slowly. 2010, I have a relapse. Nothing as bad as 2008. I'm still able to go to work and stay at work in 2010. And then in October of 2012, for some of you who've been in London and you might have been around Blackfriars, I happened to be leaving Unilever House on Victoria Embankment. I was walking over Blackfriars Bridge. It was October of 2012, walking down to Waterloo Station to get my train home. And as I'm on the bridge, my telephone goes. And I take the call and on the end of the call is my wife. And she says to me, Jeff, where are you? I said, look, I'm on my way home. She said, please, please, you need to get home very quickly. I said, why? She said, I've got terrible news. I need you at home. You can imagine where I went immediately. I mean, the first question I ask is, are the girls okay? And she said, yes, the girls are all right. But one of your closest friends died by suicide this afternoon. 
Now, I think it was Jung who once said, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Think about that statement. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. I can assure you that that applies to me. But here was my friend, my friend. He brought so much light, love, compassion, and energy to the world, and now he was gone. And I got home that night and I lay in bed and I came to a very, very simple conclusion. I lay there and I thought, what is the difference between him and me? Here I am now in 2012, October of 2012, four years after my crucible moment in life, learning to recover every single day, learning to flourish, changing my lifestyle to maintain my recovery as somebody who is susceptible to anxiety, fuel, depression. But I'm flourishing in many ways and my friend is gone. And I lie there and I think, why didn't he talk to me? I had the badge, I had the t-shirt. And I thought, what was the difference between him and me? And the only difference I could come to, the only simple conclusion that I come, could come to was that I was able to have a conversation about my mental ill health. I was able to go and see that doctor who liberated me to be able to talk about this stuff because I got a diagnosis. And he couldn't. And if you want to picture him, he was an alpha male Africana South African. And there's no ways he could have a conversation. And I lay there and I came to the conclusion that stigma, the stigma around mental ill health, the stigma around depression, the stigma around anxiety, that stigma had killed my friend. And do you know what? That's not fair. That's not fair. And I thought, I have to do something about that. I didn't know where to start. I'm a South African living in the UK. That night I wrote to a guy, a senior, used to be a very senior politician here in the UK when Tony Blair was in power. He was doing a lot of campaigning and advocacy. I found his website. I wrote him an email that night. And I just said, look, please, will you meet with me? And his name was Alistair Campbell. Within 10 minutes, I got a response from Alistair Campbell. A week later, we met up close to where he lives. And ever since that day, November of 2012, because of his influence, because of his reach, he began to open some doors, which allowed me to take tiny, tiny footsteps, tiny footsteps, footsteps, back in 2012, tiny, on a journey filled with a deep sense of purpose. And that is to create workplaces everywhere around the world where people in those workplaces feel that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and ask for some help. Because you know, one conversation, just one conversation that somebody feels comfortable to be able to have, that one conversation might just save a life. And I'm not sitting here today talking to you all in India and saying that had my friend been able to have one conversation, he would definitely be alive today. I'm not saying that for one minute. But what I am saying is had he been able to have that one conversation, there's a tiny, tiny chance, a grain of sand chance that he would still be alive today. He'd still be alive had he been able to have that one conversation. And you know, that tiny chance, to give somebody that tiny chance, that's worth fighting for every single day of my life. It's worth fighting for. And my challenge to you as an HR community, to people who are, who are passionate about people, about people development, about creating organizations and cultures where people can perform at their best, my challenge to you as an HR community is what are you doing to create an environment, facilitate creating an environment in your organizations where people who are struggling with a mental ill health condition feel it's actually okay to just ask for some help, to just ask for some help. You know, we talk about diversity and inclusion. How can we be an inclusive workplace if we can't talk about our mental health, our mental ill health? And we can only talk about our physical health. How inclusive is that? That I can't bring my whole self to work. I often hear HR people and people in organizations saying, 
oh, come on, we want you to bring your whole self to work. Well, until you do, until you do bring your whole self to work. And so I am passionate. That is why I'm so passionate about trying to create these kind of workplaces. And what I want to share with you a little bit this afternoon is, is what are some of my lessons? What are some of the lessons I'm learning as I journey this path of a life filled with a sense of purpose? And you know, I think it was, I don't know who said this, but somebody said that having a sense of purpose in your life, it'll take you to people and to places you could never imagine. Well, I can tell you three months ago, one month ago, I could never have imagined talking to you all tonight. But that sense of purpose takes you to people and to places one could never, ever imagine. And I've been so lucky over the last couple of years as I've traveled this path to work in different countries, different sectors. And I've, I've begun to learn some simple principles around our health, our well-being, our mental health, and how do we address the stigma. And I want to share some of those with you today. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that everybody can see my screen. Uh, Pallavi, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I can. We can. Okay, okay great. So the first thing that I wanted to just share with you is this term well-being. What do we mean by well-being? What do we mean by health? And a lot of my thinking, a lot of my thinking is influenced by this framework around our health, our well-being. And it's not my framework, but it's a framework that has been developed by Warwick and Edinburgh University here in the UK. And our health is made up of our physical health. And you know, we, we, we get and maintain good physical health by sleeping well, by taking time out to recover. How many of you ever take out a bit of time during the course of the day, every two hours to just have a five minute recovery break? Or do you think you are like I was, I thought I was a machine and I didn't need to recover. I could work 24 seven. Well, guess what? I broke. And so recovery, recovery, recovery has become an essential part of my everyday routine taking those moments out to recover. Yes, being active is good for my physical health. Yes, eating and drinking the right stuff is good for my physical health. And then above our physical health, we get our emotional health. These are our feelings. And we have, we have something like 330 odd feelings from contentment to sadness, to feeling depressed, anxious, happy. Those are our feelings. And the two biggest drivers of our emotional health are our relationships with the people we love, the people we work with. When those relationships are soured, it really has a huge impact on our emotions, how we feel. And the other big driver of our emotional health is our financial security, how we feel financially. And then we have our mental health. That's our cognitive ability. It's our ability to think clearly, to have good attention span, to look at some data, analyze the data, make a decision, make a good judgment. That's our mental health. It's our cognitive ability. It's a wonderful thing to have, good mental health. Oh, it's so good when you feel that you can focus, you can remember stuff, you can make good decisions. But sometimes our emotions cloud our cognitive ability. When you feel very anxious, 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 and try and read a document, you can't remember what you read. You're gonna read it three, four times over because you're feeling so anxious. So you can see how our emotional health can influence our mental health. And then right at the top of the triangle, Warwick Edinburgh talk about our spiritual health. And I tend to, when I go into large organizations, I tend to talk more about that sense of purpose, that sense of meaning. And so a lot of what I'm gonna say this afternoon is very much driven by and influenced by this framework. And I'm gonna focus very much on the kind of emotional and mental health piece. You know, what are some of the things that you could be doing to create workplaces where people feel they can talk about their emotional health when it's stressed or their mental health when it might be stressed. And I think that COVID-19, if we just think of the context that we're in right now, you know, we all know the physical effects of COVID. We all know what the physical effects of COVID. I'm sure you know, you've got a dry cough, you've got a temperature, you lose your taste and smell. We all know those physical effects of COVID-19. But what we haven't been talking much about are the psychological effects of COVID-19. You know, the increased feelings of fight and flight, 
reductions to our immune system, increased feelings of stress, anxiety, desperation, sadness. And you know, I think right now as HR professionals who want to lead for healthy workplaces where people's lives are enhanced by coming to work, I think it's so important that we as leaders, we cognizant of this and we're sending a message to our people, it's actually okay to experience some of these effects. It's actually okay. And you know why it's okay? Because there are a number of factors that are contributing to these effects. You know, there are, there's uncertainty out there, huge uncertainty. We're seeing huge disruption to social connections. People are having to learn to work from home again, or having to, for the first time ever, work from home, disrupting those relationships, those social connections that are so, so important for our emotional health. We've got a different schedule now that we're trying to operate. People, there are people out there that have got really concerned about their financial security, which is impacting their emotional health, their mental health. There's lots of fear around the virus. People are fearful of the virus. They're fearful of being in touch with people, going to work. There are huge changes in the family system that are taking place. People working from home, mothers having to be you know, work as a work during the day, mother, educate kids. I mean, all these changes, fathers doing the same in the family system. And you know, I've just seen some data that has come out of the US recently, um, some data around the impact that COVID-19 is having uh, in the US in terms of the increased numbers of people that are feeling depressed, stressed, anxious, 200% increase since February in levels of depression, anxiety. And you know, why is that? Why is that? That's because hundreds of families are feeling bereaved right now. They've lost loved ones. There's a high degree of bereavement. There are people working on the front line that are seeing trauma and feeling the trauma, seeing people die in front of them and feeling traumatized. There are people really concerned about their financial security. There are people petrified of the virus. There are parents worried about their kids' education. All of these factors, all of these factors are contributing to the psychological effects of COVID-19. And we, there is a tsunami about to hit us in terms of mental ill health conditions as we move through uh, this particular period. And so I think it's so important that we as leaders are sending a message to our people to say, you know what? It's actually okay. It's okay not to be okay right now because of some of these factors that are contributing to those psychological effects. Now, I thought it was important that as we talk about depression and anxiety, I do think that it's really important that at this time, we as leaders, we as HR professionals, and remember, I'm one of your tribe. I spent many, many years in HR, so I'm one of your tribe. But I think we have got to be in touch with what are some of the symptoms around anxiety and depression? And I, I, these slides have been made available to Mitch, so we'll make sure that you can get some of them. But it, these just give you, I think it's so important that, you know, when people are working from home right now, when they're not in the office all the time, your family members, what are some of the symptoms around anxiety, around depression? Now, I wish somebody had taught me some of these symptoms. I might have gone and asked for help a little bit earlier. I remember I used to wake up with a dry mouth every morning and wonder what was that all about? You know, I used to have poor concentration. I had this irritability. I would have these catastrophizing thoughts. I mean, these were some of the symptoms of anxiety. And you'll see I put a health warning on the slide, which says these symptoms are considered anxiety and depression if they persist for a period of four to five weeks, because we all feel these symptoms. You know, we all feel these symptoms. Sometimes we have a day where we feel some of that, but then it goes away. But if those symptoms persist for a period of four to five weeks, please, please talk to somebody. Maybe go and see a medical doctor just to have that conversation. And then we've got some of the symptoms around depression. You know, you've got cognitive symptoms. We've got some behavioral symptoms. We've got some of the physical symptoms, emotional symptoms around depression. And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between anxiety and depression because the symptoms can be 
interrelated. I often think of a scale of 0 to 10. 0 is general anxiety disorder, 10 is depression, manic depression. I was a three, a four. I was more anxious than I was depressed. But some people might feel more depressed, real self-neglect, real neglect of responsibilities, always feeling sad or completely emotionless, significant changes in weight, putting on weight or losing weight. So those are just some of them. I just wanted to share with you as we, as we move into this and talk about mental ill health, you know, what are some of the symptoms and how are they different to just normal levels of stress? Now, imagine if we could try and create an organization, a workplace where people feel that it's actually okay to put their hands up and to have this conversation. And I'm gonna share with you what I think are some of those critical success factors. But before I do that, I just wanna share one other insight that I've had over the last couple of years. And the insight that I've had over the last couple of years, as I've worked across organizations all around the world in different sectors, the most limiting resource that I see in workplaces today, the most limiting resource, and it doesn't matter what sector I go into, the most limiting resource is the energy of people. The energy of people. People are frazzled. They can't wait for a Friday evening and they hate a Monday morning. They are frazzled. And we've created workplaces where we suck every bit of energy out of people. And if you were to think about energy, I would say that energy, the energy of your people is your most important asset. Because people who've got energy perform. Energy is probably the most important driver of individual, team, and organizational performance. Look at Kohli, the energy that he brings to the Indian cricket team, and look how they perform. Because he's fueled with passion and he's fueled with energy. And do you know where we get our energy from? We get our energy from our health, from our well being. And I'm just going to go to that slide again. Yeah, our health, our well being, that's what gives us energy. When we physically, emotionally, mentally, and purposely fit, we get our energy. And so a lot of what I would, and it's not for today, I'd love to do another session with you sometime, but I would ask you as HR people, where is the energy, if you accept that the energy of your people is the most important driver of individual team and organizational performance, why then is health not a strategic priority in your business? Why is it not a strategic priority? It's probably the most in, important enabler of performance. Why have we not elevated to enhancing the health of our people to being a strategic priority in an organization versus running a well being week where we have one week of looking after people's well being and then the other 51 weeks of the year we fill them to death? Why is it not a strategic priority? We spend billions in health and safety. Guess what? It all goes to safety. You know, I don't know how many organizations I walk into and they give me the health and safety pamphlet and I read it. It's all about safety. I say to them, cross out the word health. You're not interested in enhancing the health of people or keeping people he uh, healthy here. This is all about safety. Imagine if we could take some of the funds that we spend on safety and dedicate it to investing in the health of people. Why? Because healthy people are energized and energized people perform. It must be the most important driver of individual team and organizational performance. But we can't go down this route about beginning to have conversations with people in workplaces around their health, around their energy, if we still have significant stigma around mental ill health. And so I wanna go back to my slide that I had up to kind of just share with you, what are some of the learnings? What are some of the things that I'm learning? And by the way, I learn every day, so I haven't got all the answers. I'm not an expert. All I am is somebody who's had lived experience of mental ill health and is trying to create these workplaces where we can have these conversations. And for me, the most important, the starting point in terms of critical success factors, the starting point has to be education. It has to be. It has to be teaching every single person in your organization, teaching them what is stress, what is depression, what is anxiety, what are the symptoms to look out for, both in yourself, as a leader who's leading other people, what should I be looking out for? 
how do I have a conversation if I notice that somebody's normal behavior has not been normal for three or four weeks? I notice some of the symptoms. How do I, as that line manager, start the conversation? How do I start that conversation? Or how do I, as the individual who's speaking those things, start the conversation with my line manager? How do we reintegrate somebody back into the workplace after they've been ill? And so education, education. You know, I bet you in all of your workplaces, when people join your work, they have a safety briefing. They get some safety education. Well, if we want to address the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces, and I know that this sounds simple and simplistic, but it is simple and it is simplistic. But it's about having the will, the will to invest in educating everybody in the organization, like we do with safety around mental health, mental ill health, the symptoms, how to have supportive conversations. And it's so simple, yet why, is it, why isn't there the will to do this? Do people think that if we start having these conversations, it's going to, it's going to lead to all sorts of problems? Well, that's not been my experience. And if we can do it in a, in, a, in a controlled, in an educative way, as part of people's development in the organization, where they're learning about this stuff, so that, we, so that we, what we do is as we educate people more and more we raise the levels of understanding we raise the levels of compassion around mental ill health we begin to create a culture where people feel it might just be okay to talk about this so education 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 the second critical success factor has to be in the area of what i call campaigning awareness building running campaigns internally around mental health you know i've seen some wonderful campaigns you know with some companies here in the uk and other parts of the world like one campaign i remember seeing you know was a campaign that was run twice a year and it was it was all about how are you dot 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 really because how often do we ask people how are they and they say they're not very well and then we just ask them where's the presentation that you said you were going to get to me at 12 o'clock. So running a campaign around how are you, dot, 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 really. Asking that question twice, three times. There was a lovely campaign that Citibank did recently where, where individuals in the organization who had a compassionate, who had an understanding relationship to mental ill health, those individuals wore green armbands. So when you got in the lift of the morning and you saw somebody with a green armband on and you might be struggling with your mental ill health, you knew you could go to that person. They would be compassionate. They would be supportive. They would help you. Wonderful campaign around raising the awareness around mental ill health. I think the other thing that we have to think about as a critical success factor is the language. And I think for you, you know, I can't, I can't tell you what is the right language to use in India around mental health. Is it mental health? Is it mental fitness? Is it mental well-being? But what is the right language? How can we create a more, a more positive and aspirational narrative around mental health? You know, I often say that brand mental health, it's the most damaged brand I've ever come across, the most damaged brand. You know why it's the most damaged brand? Because whenever people use the word mental health, we immediately go to illness. We go to depression, we go to anxiety, we go to bipolar, we go to post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, when somebody uses the word mental health, that's where we go immediately. Now, when I use the word physical health, people don't immediately go to glandular fever, cancer, diabetes. If you were in Mumbai and you walked into a Nike store or you walked into some an Adidas store, or in Bangalore, where most of you are, and you walked into those stores, you'd walk into the store, and if it was a Nike store, you would, you would see all over the walls what I call chiseled whippets, people with beautiful bodies. And you know, I walk into that store and I look at my own body and I think, gee, I haven't got a body like that, but I'd love to have a body like that. 
So I go and buy a pair of running shoes or I get some weights or a pull-up machine because I'm inspired by the image that I see around physical health. What is the image you see around mental health? The images we see is all about black and white photographs, people with their hands in their heads. There's nothing inspirational. There's nothing aspirational about mental health, mental fitness, and how do we maintain good mental health and good mental fitness. And so I think campaigning, language, creating that positive brand around mental health. And of course, they're going to be people that are ill and we need to support those people. The third is about storytelling. And, you know, I know that this is probably very, very difficult, you know, within your current environment and culture, encouraging people to get out there and to share some of their stories like I've done today. You know, every single story that we tell, every story that gets told, it's like sending a lifeboat out into the ocean. And the billions of people that are suffering in silence, they cling on to that lifeboat when they see it, when they hear that lifeboat, they cling on and they realize, they realize they're not alone. They realize they might just be normal. And so storytelling, and you know, I always, there's a wonderful example I always talk about around storytelling and the work that I did when I was in Unilever around addressing stigma together with a guy called Tim Munden. And as we, as I shared my story, as more senior influential people in the organization shared some of their stories, and by the way, you don't all have a story like mine, which is a crucible moment, but you've got a friend, you've got a daughter, you've got a son, you might have a mother, a father who might have struggled in the past. And, and by the way, if you're going to tell a story about somebody else, please get their permission first. Please, please get their permission because there's so much stigma still. So you've got to get their permission. But you know, I always tell the story about, um, about our chief scientist in Unilever at the time. And, uh, you know, he looked after 3,000 scientists all over the world, big research center in Bangalore. And, um, you know, I remember he came in one day and he wrote a blog to his 3,000 scientists saying, what was it like to be the father of a daughter who suffers from general anxiety disorder? What was it like for him to be the father of a daughter who suffered from anxiety? And he wrote this blog of what that was like. You know, the scientist in Bangalore, she knew that she had a boss who had a compassionate and an understanding relationship. It was such a powerful lever of normalizing this conversation, of, of, of building a cadre of people who want to and will and feel that it's safe enough to share their story. So storytelling, storytelling is probably the most powerful driver of addressing the stigma, of breaking the stigma of mental ill health. But I probably wouldn't go down storytelling first until we've done some of the education and we've created a, a climate and an environment where there's a greater level of awareness, understanding, compassion for this particular issue. But storytelling, storytelling, so, so powerful. And then finally, you know, and it's probably where you start. If you're going to go down this track of beginning to educate people, you're going to run campaigns, you're going to try and normalize the language, you're going to make it more aspirational. You're going to get stories out there in your organization. Before you do that, please make sure you've got the support resources in place, you know, because part of the education to line managers is they are not, they're not psychiatrists, they're not therapists. But what's so important is that they've just got to show compassion, they've got to show love, and they've got to be able to signpost the individual to support and making sure that your organization has got the right support resources in place where people can turn to, to get the help, to get the support that they might need to have that one conversation, which will hopefully lead to their recovery. And so those are some of the success factors. Those are some of the things, and I know some of those, you know, you might say, cheap is that so simple? Well, guess what? They are simple. They are simple. And it's about the will. It's about the will to want to do this. It's about the will to want to create an environment where just one conversation, just one conversation could save a life, it could save a life. Or it could just make somebody breathe a little easier. I think it was Ralph Emerson who once said, the definition of success is if all I did every single day was help per one person breathe a little bit easier, that is success. And so hopefully I've given you a sense of why am I so passionate about addressing the stigma of mental ill health? 
in workplaces all over the world. Hopefully I've given you a sense of what is, what is the health of our people? What's it made up of? What is our well-being? What is our emotional health? What is our mental health? Hopefully I've given you a sense of, or got you to think about, why is the health of our people not a strategic priority? And if you were to have me back one day, I'd love to share with you what that might look like. What might organizations do to really elevate health to being a strategic priority? And hopefully I've given you a sense of, a sense of um, what is it that we need to do to invest in, to break the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces. And finally, I'm gonna leave you with my final message and lesson. And it is a lesson all around self-care. I've given you, you'll see in the slides, there's, there's quite a few little ideas and tips on how people can look after their mental and emotional health during the outbreak. And I leave those with you to have a look at. There's some very simple, basic tips. But I wanna leave you with a, uh, a final thought. And that is, as HR professionals, as people who, are, who want to develop people, this movement around people development that you talk about as an organization, creating HR professionals that are gonna to contribute to this movement in India around people development. People cannot develop themselves. People cannot perform if they're not healthy. And so people are no longer your most important asset. The health and the energy of your people is the most important asset. Now, as an HR professional, you cannot care for the health of any of your people if you don't care for your own health. And you know, my biggest lesson as a result of my crucible moment in life is that the most important priority in my life is my health. It's the most important priority. It's more important than my children. It's more important than my wife. Because when I'm not healthy, I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband. And so it has to be the most important priority in my life. How often, how often, when you get on an airplane and the air hostess says, you know what, if this airplane goes down and the oxygen mask drops and you've got your daughter sitting next to you, who do you put the oxygen mask on first? You put it on yourself first before you put it on your daughter. How often do you put that oxygen mask on yourself? How often are you attending to looking after your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health, and that sense of purpose and meaning? And if you can't prioritize that, if you can't see it as be the most important priority in your life, if you can't care for your own health, you won't be able to care for any of your employees' health, none of their health, if you can't care for your own. And the simple acronym that I'm gonna leave you with is what I've been learning in order for me to look after my physical, my emotional, mental, and having that sense of purpose is a lovely little acronym called CAN DO. And the C stands for connect. Remember I said to you, connection is a huge driver of emotional health, relationships, connecting to nature, connecting to communities, connecting with people, connecting to that self, that sense of meaning, connection, connection, connection. How much time do you put aside each day to just do some connection? Connecting with the people you love, going for a walk in nature, it just, Connection. There's a wonderful book written by Johan Hari, and he talks about the increased incidence of depression and anxiety in the world. And he says part of the reason for that is we've lost our ability to connect. We've lost our ability to connect to a sense of meaning, a sense of meaningful values. We've lost our ability to connect to community, friends, family. We've lost our ability to connect to nature. We've lost our ability to connect to a, to a hopeful view of the future. And so C, can do is a huge driver of my emotional health. And I put 10, 15 minutes aside every day to do some connection. The A, simple, it stands for active. Just be active. I'm not asking you to go and run a marathon, but maybe you just go and take a 10 minute walk every single day or a 15 minute walk where you're just active. You're getting that blood flowing. Active, active, active. Because it's good for your physical health. The N stands for try and be nice to somebody every single day. And see what that does for emotional health. See what that does to that sense of purpose that you're giving to somebody else. You're being nice to somebody. The N stands for nice. So important. The D is all about discover, learning something new, getting those, that cognitive ability, the fitness, those neurons working, learning, being curious, learning something new, listening to a podcast, understanding something that you've always wanted to learn about. 
It's such an important driver of our mental health, our cognitive abilities. And the O stands for observe. Just taking that time out, five minutes, every two hours to just observe. It's the most difficult one for me because the, my, my mobile phone and that connection to technology is so addictive. And to just be able to go and stand outside, look in the daylight, look at the leaves, look at the color of the sky and just be in observation mode. And some people might call that meditation, mindfulness. You know, we've got so much here in the Western world to learn from some of the wonderful techniques that you've taught the world as a country around meditation and mindfulness. But you know what? In the modern world, we've become so busy. We've become so busy. We've forgotten about those things. We don't do it anymore. We don't think it's important. And then we wonder why we are struggling with high incidence of mental and emotional health. And so let me end there and then hand back to Pallavi because there might be some questions, a bit of a conversation that we can have in the last uh, 20 minutes of our session. Hopefully at the end of the day, all I've done is I have either, for some of you, I might have confirmed a belief for you. And in confirming that belief, you might just feel a little inspired to go the extra mile to address the stigma of mental ill health in your workplaces. For others of you, I might have challenged a belief. I might have challenged some of your beliefs around this whole area of mental health. And in challenging that belief, maybe you'll just go and do something differently. I can't leave you today without asking you to just think of three things that you can do as an individual. Just as an individual. You don't need the organization. Just as an individual, what could you go and do to start this journey of addressing the stigma of mental ill health? The first is reflect on your own relationship to mental ill health. Is that relationship a relationship of intolerance or is it a relationship of compassion and understanding? And if you're intolerant to mental ill health, all I ask you to do is go and be curious, go and learn, go and be educated, just be curious about the subject. The second thing that I would ask you to do is just start a conversation, just start a conversation. Because if we can just have the conversation like we're having today, anything, anything becomes possible. But if you can't have the conversation, nothing is possible. And then finally, when you're ready, when the environment is right, please tell your story. Because every story that we tell is like sending a lifeboat out into the ocean where the billions of people who are suffering in silence, they cling on to it and they realize they're not alone, and they are just normal, like me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I, yeah, really, really engaging session. I mean, you know, I was just sitting and thinking as to, um, and I think a lot of participants have sent us messages saying they're so thankful for you having shared your personal journey and your vulnerabilities. Thank you for that. Um, before we uh, take questions, and I, we have a couple of questions over here, uh, before that, I would just like to remind everyone that Michelle has put in the uh, code uh, for the feedback on Mentimeter, on menti.com. Uh, it's in the chat, so if you can look at that and give feedback. Um, and I'll get back to you, Jeff. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. So the, uh, one of the questions is around... Um, what are some what is the biggest challenge do you face when helping organizations create a workplace that promotes well-being and at what levels do you face resistance um i think the biggest challenge is is getting senior leaders in organizations to see the correlation between energy health and performance Challenge number one. You know, I live and work in this space all the time, and it's like obvious to me that the energy of our people is our most important asset. You know, when Virat Kohli is not on fire, you guys fall like you normally do. When he's on fire and he's energized and he's got that team passionate, look how they perform. And we get it from our health. And so making this link between energy, health, and performance and 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 helping 
senior leaders see that link. I think that's barrier number one. The second is the return on investment and creating the business case and how to go about creating that business case. But you know, in many ways, I'm sick and tired of business cases. You know, we look at the whole diversity and inclusion agenda. For years, we've had business cases as to why we should have more diverse senior leaders, more women in senior leadership roles. And guess what? We don't see huge, huge progress. We all know the business case. We all go to Harvard, just Google it. Business case, health performance. You'll see five, six pounds, dollars return for every one dollar or pound invested. And for me, what it is, it's about that will. It's about that will. It's about saying, you know what? This is just the right thing for us to do. It's the right thing for us to do to enhance the health of our people. It just must be the right thing. So why don't we just do it because it's the right thing to do? But sometimes you get these hard assed CFOs who are just interested in the return on investment and therefore you've got to create the business case. You know, and, and we're not as mature in the area of health as we were with safety in being able to get a business case. But it is sometimes that can be a really, really significant barrier to beginning to invest. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is that I think we should also sometimes focus more on the positive. You know, young people today, they want to work for organizations that have got a sense of purpose. They want to work for organizations where they feel that there's a sense of care. They want to work for organizations where they feel proud to be able to talk about, you know what, part of my development working for, excuse me, Shanks, but working for Infosys, guess what part of my development is? Is about enhancing my health. I've got a development plan which is about enhancing my health, not just my skills, my knowledge. They don't treat me like a unit of production. They treat me like a human being. They want me to be healthy. And they're giving me these opportunities. And guess what? I'm taking accountability to do that. And so, you know, getting some of this well being stuff to really stick, the things that are missing, Pallavi, are things like organization accountability. You know, organizations don't feel accountable to keep people healthy. All they're interested in is keeping people safe. Keep you physically safe, but then guess what? I'm not interested in your emotional or mental safety. But guess what? My cognitive ability is what I bring through the door in this organization. So why don't you want to also keep me mentally and emotionally safe? Why are you only interested in keeping me physically safe? So there's organization accountability. There's no individual accountability. We've got to drive individual accountability to well-being plans, development plans where people have as part of their development is enhancing their well-being. And then finally, elevating health to being a strategic priority. So we invest the resources, financial and human, to execute that priority like we would any other one. I hope that helps to answer the question around what are some of those barriers. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think you, you know, you, uh, you're mentioning, and we spoke about this earlier also, that it all actually starts with the leadership. So the leadership Absolutely. has to really start having those conversations. Now, there are two questions around, um, you know, what you spoke about, about conversations and about creating campaigns, etc. So one of them is that, have you found that if uh, organizations have mental health first aiders in the workplace, it helps to reduce stigma and uh, people uh, open up after such programs? And also, how do you um, help managers, um, you know, remove the block of saying that, uh, uh, it would seem intrusive if they suggested counseling to some employee. Um, yeah, look, mental health first aid. I used to be a, 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 you know, I was on the board of mental health first aid. So I, I'm a big proponent and supporter of, of mental health first aid. Wonderful that we have some mental health first aiders on the floor, just like we have physical health first aid. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We've got to train everybody. And I'm not saying you all have to do a one day mental health first aid course or a two day and become real specialists. But what I want us to do is if we can train everybody on some of the basic stuff that I spoke about, a 90 minute, a two hour program, then we start really breaking stigma. Because, you know, because of the sensitivity of this issue, I'm unlikely to go and talk to a mental health first aider if I don't know them from a bar of soap. Yes, maybe they've done some mental health first aid training. 
but they don't know me. I've now got to introduce myself to them. You know who I will talk to? Is I'll talk to my peer who I've been working with for the last two years, three years, 10 years. But I'm only going to talk to my peer if I know they've got a compassionate understanding around mental ill health. And so I think we have to train everybody, Pallavi, so that, our, so that we can draw on our peers. Those are the people that we will turn to immediately, is to have a conversation with a peer. And if I'm not sure that my peer has got a compassionate understanding, I'm not going to have that conversation, and we're still going to have stigma. And so, yes, specialists, mental health first aiders, great. Because maybe that's where a line manager, after they've had that compassionate, that understanding relationship, they can then point to the individual, to the first aider, who can then triage and point them. I think line managers, I don't think that they should get into, I mean, we could do a whole session around what the supportive conversation looks like. I'm not sure that you've got to, you know, begin to advise people what to do because you're not a psychiatrist, you're not a therapist. But what you can do is you can signpost. What you can do is you can listen. You know, there's a lovely saying which says, I can't always be happy. I can't always be happy. But you know what I can do? I can always appreciate somebody who just listens to me. Somebody who just listens to me. And you know, sometimes some people might not take your advice. And you have to respect some of that. You can't force anybody. These are adults. And I often say you can take a horse to water, you can't make a drink. But you know what you can do as a line manager? You can give that horse a lot of salt so that maybe it does want to drink. And it's that compassion, that love, that understanding, that signposting. But at the end of the day, you've got to respect people's decisions around whether they take on and get the support that they need. I think the only time you really have to intervene is if you are concerned that that, that person could be a harm to themselves or a harm to others. Then you've got to intervene in some kind of way. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions, Jeff, around uh, best practices uh, and organizations which are doing a good job on mental health. Uh, some best practices that uh, you have come across to promote a culture of uh, employee well-being. I wish I could say that there are lots of those. Um, there are very few that have elevated the health of their people to being a truly a strategic priority. So I'm sorry that I can't share lots of best practice around that. But yes, there are organizations out there. You know, I mean, I, I, if I think of people like PwC, are doing some amazing work around the world in addressing the stigma of mental ill health. Unilever has been working really hard at this over the last five or six years on addressing the stigma of mental ill health. Citibank are doing some really good work in the area but of, of, of mental ill health. Um, you know, um, KPMG, pockets of KPMG are doing some great work. Um, you know, some of the law firms out there, the global law firms like um, uh, Rise Norton are doing some good work, you know. So, so you know, there there are, you know, and here in the UK, you know, there's some more sort of UK-based firms like utility companies, Network Rail, um, Anglia, Anglia Water, um, who are who are beginning to do some some really good work. And and what is that good work? It's you know, it's it's as simple as what I was saying. They're investing in educating everybody. They're running wonderful campaigns. They've got people sharing stories. Barclays is another one. HSBC is another one that's really trying to attend to some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, those are just some examples of organizations that are, that are taking on the global challenge and, and making a real effort to address the stigma of mental ill health. All right, so I think we have time for about just uh, one more question. Um, so what, before that, I will just, if someone has asked you to repeat the name of the book that you mentioned, and if you mention that, we can just put it up yeah, in sure. chat. And so it is, it is written by a guy called Johan Hari, H-A-R-I, Johan Hari, and the name of the book is Lost Connections. Lost Connections, all right. And the other resource that I would suggest people have a look at is a book written by Rangan Chatterjee, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, and it is called The Four Pillar Plan. And the final resource that I would suggest people have a look at, because if you don't believe me that workplaces are diminishing people's lives, then go and read Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, P-F-E-I-F-F-E-R. Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who has just written a book 
dying for the paycheck, dying for the paycheck. All the longitudinal research into what workplaces are doing to diminish people's lives. All right. Um, I guess just the last question, Jeff, um, and that is, uh, and I think people are asking it also because of the time uh, that we are in right now, um, is what should we do uh, to take care of the physical and mental well-being of the people now? Maybe one, if you can just share one or two tips that people can take back to their workplace. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Let me just, uh, can I go back onto screen? Um, can you see my screen? Uh, we can see a screen, but I don't think, you are you presenting? No. I want to be able to present something. Um, uh, how do I? Avinash, can you? Hold on, there we go. Show. Okay, right. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, Pallavi, I, if you have a look, um, we probably didn't have enough time to go through all of this, but I have, you know, in terms of around COVID-19 and just a few things here that I, that I would share is, and that I'd encourage people to think about in terms of looking after their mental and emotional health. So it's these slides, you know, try and avoid speculation around the outbreak and just, you know, use only reputable sources on the outbreak. Because if you, if you listen to what social media tells you and all these other things, it just increases your levels of stress and anxiety. Try and stay connected, you know, keeping in touch with friends, with family, set up some private chat groups, you know, and you can, and you can take this to the, to the organizational level as well. You know, how do you enhance connection? How, do, can you, how can you ensure that people are staying connected? You know, encourage people to, 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 to manage how they're following the outbreak in the media and just limit their consumption. You know, if the media is getting on top of you and you're feeling stressed, just limit your consumption of that media. Um, you know, the other thing would be um, try and acknowledge how you're feeling. You know, get people to acknowledge how they're feeling. And that's why it's so important, I think, right now, you know, that, that people in your organizations know that they can talk about this stuff. You've sent messages out, you've created a culture, you, you know, where people feel that they can talk about this and that they can, you know, they can have that conversation. Try and encourage people in your workplace to stick to a daily routine, you know, keeping active, trying to have a balanced diet right now, you know, taking that lunch break, you know, having a regular start and an end to the day, practicing a bit of meditation and some mindfulness, you know, so these are just, you know, these are just a couple of ideas and some thoughts that people can do. You know, the other thing is, you know, just this little slide here around some, some questions you could, you could get people to ask themselves, you know, uh, employees, what are they grateful for today? You know, who are they going to check in on? Who are they going to connect with today? What expectation of normal are they going to let go of? Because nothing is normal right now. So we can't, we can't expect to be operating like normal. So what are we going to let go of? How am I going to get outside? How am I going to move my body? You know, what can I do today to achieve my goal? So just a few little ideas and a few tips on, on what you could be encouraging your, your, your employees to be doing uh, around enhancing their well-being, um, their physical, emotional, mental, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in and amongst what I've just said gives you some of those simple tips and bits of advice that people could, uh, could look at. You know, I have a final sort of message, also highly contagious is kindness, patience, love, enthusiasm, and a positive attitude. Don't wait to catch it from others. Go and be the carrier. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing uh, all your thoughts and answering all these questions. And I think, uh, you know, there's one resource that I would like to add, which you missed uh, saying, and I think uh, if people want to see the work that you're doing, and a lot of resources that if you've put up on your website, and that's that's a great resource too. Oh, thank you. Um, I've yeah. been looking at that, and it's really interesting to see the kind of resources that you've been putting up over there. So I would urge people who are interested to know more to uh, visit Jeff's uh, website. It's the same, jeffmcdonald.com, right? 
No, .co.uk. .co .co.uk, .co.uk, and you will see a whole lot of resources there. So once again, on behalf of um, NHRD Bangalore chapter, um, I would like to thank you for being with us today and to share sharing your perspectives and um, thanking Chris Shankar once again for introducing uh, you to us. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you, and thanks for having me. And thank you. take care, everyone. You Thank too. you, Jeff. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, it was a lovely session, Jeff, and we've been getting a lot of uh, feedback. Oh, good. Thanks for the insights that you've shared with us. Um, an amazing last 90 minutes that we had listening to you. Thank Thanks, you so Jeff. much. And yeah. will you, I mean, I'd love to, you know, just if you can share some of, I love the good, I love the bad, and I love the ugly, because I'm always trying to improve. So, you know, if there are a bit, some bits of feedback, uh, uh, good, bad, and ugly that you can share with me, I'd really appreciate that. I'll definitely yes. do that. I'll definitely share the uh, feedback with you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, when we started, uh, we had over 175 people who had logged in. Um, wow. We still have close to about 130 people here. Wow. So uh, last wow. 90 minutes has been, has been great for all of us. Thank you, audience, uh, for, for uh, being uh, here on the ses session. We'll see you next month, uh, last Thursday of the month, with another exciting uh, episode. If you have any suggestions, do write to us, and we'll be happy to look at it. Um, thank you, Avinash, from the National Chapter for helping up uh, on the entire technology. Thank you so much. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night.